So these days it has become a, a very popular kind of topic here, particularly in the West. Uh, the interaction between Buddhism and science has been going on for the last uh, more than 30 years. And uh, lots of serious researches have been on about which we will talk later. And before that, because I am asked to speak on Buddhism and science, so Buddhism is a, uh, basically uh, an Indian entity. And uh, so I would like to speak a little bit about the Buddhism and uh, the tradition of Nalanda and then how it went to Tibet and then how it came to India and to the rest of the world to, you know, to set the background. As you all know that uh, Buddha brought uh, revolution in the Indian uh, civilization, in the, particularly in the field of philosophy and uh, spirituality. In philosophy, Buddha, Buddha brought uh, many uh, new elements which uh, brought, as I said, a revolution in a philosophical uh, system. And then, in the similar manner, he brought a revolution in uh, Indian spirituality because he did not accept a ritual kind of, uh, you know, uh, of course, there are certain rituals, but uh, rituals are the, the peripheral in Buddhism, but not as the central kind of, you know, central to Buddhism. So the basic spiritual system in Buddhism is the transformation of mind. And therefore, for that reason, philosophy is very much required. For that reason, the system of uh, the science of mind and the mind training is very much required. That is how these two are very much interconnected. And the approach of uh, Buddha has been uh, very scientific in the sense that uh, he give the gave the liberty to his uh, uh, disciples and his pupils and followers that you can choose, you can test. And he has said, uh, as many of you are well versed in Sanskrit, tapat chetat Nikishat, Swarnam Eva Panditai, Pariksha Bhikshavo Grahim Madhubacho, Natu Gaurvat. So, which means that, uh, O Bhikshu, you test my teachings just as a goldsmith test the gold by rubbing, by cutting, and by burning. But don't accept my teachings just because you respect me. So, this is the liberty that he has given to his. Uh, uh, disciples and followers. So accordingly, his disciples, the great masters and the galaxies of the uh, philosophers and, and uh, practitioners, they explored investigation, examination, analysis. These have been the mode of uh, kind of uh, study in Buddhism when it comes to the philosophy, when it comes to practice in life, when it comes to the application of these principles in life. So you can see the three major corpus of uh, Buddha's teachings. The, the Tripitaka, as uh, you know, most of you know, the Tripitaka, the three baskets of Buddha's teachings, the Vinaya Sutra and uh, Abhidharma. And uh, the content of these three uh, baskets are the Shila, Samadhi and Pragya. Shila is the moral conduct and the, based on the moral conduct then the person must have a tranquility and proper concentration of mind. So in the, <coughs> there is a wide <coughs> range of disciplines, moral disciplines for different categories of disciples according to their capability and their dispositions. And then after that, uh, once the person is able to uh, abide by the morality, then the person has the basic kind of uh, the characteristics to maintain or to cultivate uh, uh, a stable mind. 
and tranquil, um, uh, tranquility in mind. Therefore, the uh, samadhi is, uh, you know, samadhi comes. And in the samadhi and in the sutras, it is not simply to sit in the, you know, samadhi, but it, it talks about how to obtain concentration, how to meditate, and then how to transform yourself, how to transform your mind from a negative to positive, and then shun those things, abandon those uh, uh, afflictive, uh, and, you know, the, we can say these days, in, uh, in, the, in today's, uh, you know, the words we can detoxify of the mind and to de how you can detoxify your mind and things like that in, in Samadhi. And then to some extent in any way you can do it but once say you know you cannot eradicate your toxic and it, you cannot eradicate your suffering because all the sufferings are rooted to our mental attitude and they are they all come up from the you know the afflictive mind and the afflictive mind um, are grounded on not being able to see the reality. That is how philosophy is very much uh, related to spirituality in Buddhism. So the uh, understanding of reality, the cultivation of uh, wisdom is very important in Buddhism. That is how after cultivating concentration and st stability of mind, then the person is, you know, uh, person becomes eligible to cultivate wisdom. Because without uh, tranquility of mind, the person cannot, uh, you know, develop wisdom. So once the person is able to de develop wisdom, here wisdom is nothing but uh, to un understand the reality. Their realities are of uh, different you know, layers and levels. And uh, the ultimate reality of the, uh, you know, the, the, the phenomena is uh, to see the things as uh, totally interdependent and nothing substantial, intrinsically, uh, you know, concrete and uh, substantive objectively. And this is how, you know, the wisdom is according to, you know, Buddha's teaching. So, these three, morality, tranquility, concentration, and then the understanding of reality, these three are the core elements of the core teachings of the Buddha. So, therefore, the nature of reality is the central focus of Buddhist philosophy, right? And similarly, and then this, uh, uh, this uh, philosophy, the understanding of reality is... Uh, developed uh, through investigation, through analysis, through, uh, you know, through examinations. Of course, in ancient India, we, an in ancient world, we did not have uh, laboratories and things like that, of course, and these, uh, for the investigation and for the analysis of these, uh, uh, you know, realities, we do not need, we cannot have, uh, you know, the external material kind of laboratory, because uh, they are not tangible, they are not physical, and so where is that, uh, you know, laboratory? Laboratory is here. So they go wherever they go with the laboratory, and there is, I will be talking later, very rich epistemological and logical processes uh, through which they, you know, develop this apparatus to uh, realize the reality, right? So, and the realization of reality, which is, uh, the central, you know, the focus of spirituality in Buddhism is again, as I said, based on the philosophical understanding. So therefore in Buddhism, through study, through contemplation, through study, in the first stage, through contemplation in the second stage, and reaching to a con conviction that that is the reality, through analysis, examination and investigation, then you reach to that conviction. And then after that, if you reach only to that level and then leave it, your intellectual understanding is accomplished, but your realization is not accomplished. So therefore, in order to accomplish, become an accomplished, you know, uh, the practitioner, you need to meditate it, 
you need to internalize your understanding so that you can look into the world as you have you know as you have studied and for example impermanence right why buddha was in, interested in this, uh, you know exploring impermanence because impermanence is something that uh, scientists have explored and impermanence is some, something that uh, you know uh, that uh, is uh, very much uh, related to the material world then why buddha was interested in you know exploring the reality of uh, impermanence because it is very much related to our daily life how we see the things as permanent yes this has been there for the last many years this has been there my relatives are there my properties are there i am there my bodies have been there for years together so i am permanent uh, we have a kind of uh, innate feeling of being permanent and that becomes a source of suffering so therefore through contemplation and understanding and uh, you know realization of impermanence then it becomes your perception it does not become your uh, merely confined to your intellectual understanding but it becomes your you know spiritual kind of uh, um, realization which changes your perception not in terms of indoctrination but in terms of understanding the reality because when buddha taught impermanent all the products are impermanent then there was a bombardment of you know charges and allegations on buddha that uh, what is this you know we can see things uh, you know as living for ages and together but then how everything can be momentary so then buddha was talking about uh, when we have a glass of water in front of us then that glass of water changes every mo moment he said that the ghatta, because the, the most common kind of, you know, examples we had in our philosophical schools in India, we have ghatta, patta, and all these, uh, angura, and uh, we have a common kind of examples, right? So ghatta, patta, the ghatta is, uh, has been there in, in existence for years together, but every particle to, to the level of, uh, you know, atomic and subatomic level, it, you know, disintegrates every and then forms a new kind of you know generation so buddha said that right at that time and there was a lots of you know uh, interaction amongst these uh, philosophical schools that uh, how this can be possible the, the, the why i'm saying here is that because the impermanence of course is the nature of reality out there with the matter but we need to understand it in order to change our perspective. Our perspective is very much related to our, you know, emotions. And our emotions are very much related to our suffering and life, daily life. And that is why it is very much connected. Unless we change our, you know, glasses, unless I have a very, you know, good power <laughs> glass, I cannot see this, you know. So it is a real life kind of problem. So therefore, uh, the, seeing the you know object uh, material world as it is, as it is yathavat, that is yathabud yathavat, is the Buddha's you know motto, right? And then we have uh, the uh, two kind of you know two truths, uh, ultimate truth and reality, you know the the conventional truths. I won't go into those matters. And then the ultimate truth has uh, different varieties of explanation and connotations and inter interpretations by the four major schools in buddhism two of them the two of them are realist schools one is a mind only school idealistic school and the third one is a, you know skeptic school and each of these schools have many sub schools sub schools and so lots of you know philosophical uh, systems uh, existed and still they do exist and the poor noble truth uh, primarily projects the uh, kind of you know the uh, transformation of mind how we can so again i won't go into the math you know the details but uh, as you know that uh, truth of suffering truth of origin of suffering truth of cessation of suffering and origin of suffering and path to the you know cessation so again, the truth of suffering 
and we all experience and there are different layers and subtle you know through you know sufferings but the subtle you know sufferings are not uh, uh, identified by common beings but uh, the, we all experience suffering but then what is what are the causes and the origin of this suffering they are all our mental attitude our afflictive mind and again afflictive mind is rooted to the distorted uh, you know perception of reality right again it goes back to that so analysis investigation comes into the picture so therefore in buddhism in order to understand the reality as i said earlier we need uh, apparatus to understand the realities so therefore very very high level of epistemology very high level and sophisticated uh, system of logic developed in course of time right the, these are developed in order to explore the reality and we have the sensual kind of perceptions and we have uh, the you know the inferential knowledges one is the direct and one is the inferred and indirect kind of knowledge uh, received you know uh, attaining knowledge so we have a uh, very complex this is not only with the buddhism but in india itself uh, the logic and the epistemology system uh, became very rich in course of time uh, you know um, uh, with the, particularly with the vedanta nyaya and buddhism and uh, uh, jaina so nalanda vikramashila takshashila and odandapuri were the prominent buddhist monastic universities where these disciplines developed to a very high level so not only and there was a strong vibrant interaction amongst the buddhist schools uh, but there was a rich and vibrant interaction between buddhist and non buddhist philosophical schools uh, uh, schools of uh, sankhya vedanta mimansa naya nayikas and jainas because of this uh, kind of high level of you know the rich and in, uh, intensive interaction uh, on in philosophical systems epistemology and logic uh, the whole system advanced to a great height the philosophical argumentations were insightful rich and enriched the philosophical schools each other uh, which uh, became a unique tradition uh, that uh, gave rise to a culture of uh, free thinking respect for diversity with the accommodative attitude this is something that uh, you know a kind of a culture developed in india which we cannot find anywhere you know at any time on this globe in human history so these kind of interactions we learned that uh, of course today within few seconds uh, we can reach to the other parts of the world but during those times when there was a kind of you know there was a, a, a text on epistemology logic or philosophy uh, written in kashmir or you know or magadha then it was responded from south india by a vedantin or a nayayika within two months and this is the wonderful thing that we have you know in india we had in india in the past and that was also not done just simply to you know make allegations and charges and things like that but they seriously read the text and 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 the charges or you know the 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 arguments advanced from the other school they read it study it and then modify their own standings and then make advanced kind of move in in their text and this is a, this is the way they moved forward and the whole uh, you know intellectual system in india from you know 6th century to 12th century developed to in a very, in a very you know uh, progressive manner if you read the texts of uh, nayayika so buddhist and vedanta and uh, you know jaina you can see that uh, buddhism had been the the single interlocutor with the rest of the indian philosophical schools so that was also sometimes you know argumentations but but in many of you know most of the cases very receptive and they accept the charges if that you know uh, 
that is, uh, you know, modifiable, then they modify their system and then, uh, you know, they move, move further. So this is how uh, they, you know, they respected each other and uh, the respect, that is why they accept the charges and modify themselves, you know. And uh, in many of the texts, like we can see that Bodhaha uh, Pramana Patavaha. So Buddhists are very good in uh, epistemology and logic. Yeah. So by making, uh, you know, charges and argumentations uh, to say this kind of, you know, appreciative word is uh, something that they appreciate each other, right? So, and Buddhism also has uh, these kind of statements uh, in their text saying that uh, they are very analytical, they are, you know, charges are very sharp and this should be, you know, paid attention uh, while we, you know, read these things, right? So these kind of things that we can see uh, in ancient Indian, you know, philosophical kind of, you know, culture. That is one of the reasons that uh, why in this very, you know, pious uh, land, so many different uh, indigenous uh, philosophical schools and religious systems uh, developed and sustained, lived together and uh, in a very harmonious way. Not only that, but also India received uh, so many religious and philosophical schools from outside and lived together harmoniously. So this is something that we cannot find anywhere in the world and uh, which His Holiness the Dalai Lama always says that this is something that the world has to learn from India, the Indian culture, the heart of the Indian culture. Diversity is in the very nature of the Indian culture. These great monastic learning centers were the places where all other disciplines like medicine, literature, art, science were not only pursued but advanced further. The entire tradition of Nalanda, Vikramashila, Takshashila were brought uh, to Tibet from 7th to 12th century. Tibet embraced Buddhism in 7th uh, century AD. The whole process of importing Buddhism and other Indian studies to Tibet was undertaken with great care, uh, uh, with great care systematically in a great manner. Cream of the cream Indian scholars were invited. Nearly about 200 Indian scholars were invited from those in Ananda, Vikram, Shila, Takshishila and great learning centers. Hundreds of uh, Tibetan youngsters were sent to those great uh, monastic uh, you know, learning centers. Translations, uh, around 5,000 texts were done into Tibetan from Indian languages, primarily from Sanskrit. And uh, the procedures of the translation were, you know, unprecedented. Even today, when we have all these, you know, uh, facilities uh, with, uh, you know, so many uh, dictionaries and, uh, you know, uh, we have so many facilities, but uh, if you compare the standard the translation done in Tibet from 7th century to 12th century, then it is not comparable in terms of literal, maintaining the literal content and maintaining the thematic content. It, all these are maintained in such a manner that uh, that is one of the reasons that when we restore these days back from Tibetan to Sanskrit, then it is almost, uh, we can bring it, uh, almost to 100% we can bring back because the root of the uh, words, the suffix, uh, prefix, and all these are maintained in Tibetan translation. So the you know the the the, um, the translation centers which were created in in Lhasa at that time, in collaboration with the great monastic masters from India, Nalanda, Vikramashila, and those places associated with the Tibetan scholars. Uh, were great kind of you know the place where all these works are were done with the great kind of you know uh, expertise and uh, uh, profundity so in this whole transmission there has been the trans you know the the creation of the corpus of literature through translation which itself is a very very high level of intellectual exercise then after creating because 
we need to have the 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 text itself right uh, brought in Tibetan language and that was done with a great uh, high standard and then the next is to bring the knowledge authentic knowledge they transmit the authentic knowledge from those, those great monastic institutions and they were brought with the masters and the Tibetan masters went to India and they brought uh, those transmissions it was not simply confined to one or two kind of uh, schools as I mentioned earlier the root text the commentarial text the all you know sub commentarial texts all those varieties and uh, you know diverse kind of you know the the uh, related literature were you know translated into Tibetan and also the knowledge uh, was also transmitted uh, in Tibet in Tibet and the third part of the most important is the spirituality the heart of the the spirit of the text is the spiritual kind of you know the practice so every text I used to say that even in science also you can think about you know there is a corporal text then there is a transmission the content intellectual content and then the practice how you understand the the core element through your you know understanding and maturity through your contemplation and exercises you know these three are the most important element of the text and also in terms of culture so these were all done by the Tibetan scholars and Tibet Tibetan scholars authored thereafter again a lacks of you know treatises as a commentary and independent works on various subjects of philosophy literature and then you know arts and epistemology logic and on many other you know areas so what Tibet has uh, you know, contributed is uh, preservation of the Nalanda tradition which it did not when you know did not go to the southern uh, South Asian countries because South Asian countries are primarily the Theravada the Pali based uh, you know tradition and then uh, in the eastern other parts of the uh, you know Asia in China Buddhism went in true second century itself but uh, in China the the Buddhism went uh, by the selection of the individual scholars who visited India at the time uh, but uh, the the entire uh, culture intellectual kind of system did not you know go to China because as I said it was uh, based on the selection of the individual person whereas in Tibet's case it was uh, you know discussed planned and then strategically it was planned and then the 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 the, the entire uh, Buddhist philosophical schools and the system and other fields of studies uh, the texts and the you know tradition knowledge tradition and the spiritual tradition were all you know transplanted to Tibet in that manner we can say that the Nalanda tradition was uh, I used to say that it was transplanted to Tibet from 7th century to 12th century and in 13th century as we all know that uh, the all those monasteries were destroyed so now after occupation of Tibet by China then His Holiness the Dalai Lama came to India followed by around 80,000 Tibetan uh, people uh, among which there were many great uh, masters uh, scholars you know and then the the first thing that His Holiness did was to re-establish the monasteries which were you know destroyed and and uh, and, and uh, demolished in Tibet and uh, no religious practice was allowed it was totally banned and no monks can you know could be seen at that time no practice could be seen no one should can carry you know rosaries in their hand no one can wear some kind of robe like this so it was totally banned the idea was to systematically you know erase the very idea and identity of Tibet but eventually then because after reaching to India the monastery many of the in Tibet more than 6,000 monasteries and temples were destroyed and then after coming to India then eventually some of those great monastic institutions were reestablished and new institutions were established 
and the schools were, you know, started to educate the youngsters. And then eventually people came to know from the West and from many other, from many parts of the world who, you know, came to learn from the, you know, great masters. And now, later, they become the, you know, ambassadors of Buddhism and the Tibetan culture in various parts of the world in Oxford, in Cambridge, in Columbia, in Harvard, in Emory, in Michigan, in those places. So that is how Buddhist studies and because Tibetan, uh, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, which is, uh, you know, the, the nomenclature has developed as a Tibetan Buddhism, which actually is the tradition of Nalanda, which carries the complete tradition of Nalanda. So, then, once, uh, you know, after establishment of these uh, monasteries and uh, which became, which, uh, you know, came to develop further and then lots of many other uh, people also started coming to these monasteries and, uh, and then in 1980s, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, started having some interaction with the scientist. Initially, the interaction was uh, out of curiosity because his holiness uh, from his childhood liked the science and technology very much and then he was curious about many of the discoveries and many of the theories of science so he was uh, uh, in the beginning out of his curiosity interacted with the scientist and uh, and then eventually this kind of interaction became uh, you know and began to take uh, shape of a dialogue and things like that because while he was having interaction at his personal level then he put uh, many you know questions which became quite challenging to the scientists and uh, the among the scientists with whom he had uh, you know interaction to mention some of them David Bohm and uh, Vaughan Weizsäcker the quantum physicists and Sir Karl Popper, the philosophy of science, and Arthur Zeilinger, and Arthur Zines, Eric Kandel, and uh, genomist, Richard Davidson, neuroscientist, and uh, Eric, uh, Aaron, ba Aaron Burke, cognitive inventor of, a yeah, inventor of a cognitive behavior therapy, and Nancy Eisenberg, who developed, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, um, development, she did this uh, development of uh, the uh, psychotherapy. So, some, to mention just uh, some of this, and uh, when he, as I said, when he started asking challenging questions and they gave his reflections on these issues, it became a kind of interactive exercise. And up after no long, it took a shape of dialogue with the scientists of physics, uh, neuroscience, and neuropsychology, biology, astronomy, cognitive science, and clinical science. Buddhist monks and practitioners participated with His Holiness. I remember that uh, in early 1980s, uh, in a very small kind of you know uh, gathering, about uh, 30 to 40 kind of uh, the, with this. Um, um, 10-15 scientists and then 10-15 uh, uh, scholars used to get together and then there used to be a very interactive uh, five six days long kind of you know interaction and then that became more intensive and because both sides were very you know uh, serious and then were quite uh, curious and quite interested and when Buddhism started uh, giving some, you know, presentations on uh, mind and uh, mental, you know, phenomena and mind training and then, uh, you know, emotions and things like that. So then the, uh, and then, the, you know, of course, uh, dependent origination, emptiness and uh, things like that. Then the scientists from quantum physics and then scientists from neuroscience, uh, you know, and got to more interested into those areas. So, the when Buddhism talks about emptiness and you know interdependent, as I said earlier, that interdependent origination 
explains the nature of complete interdependent nature of the external phenomena and internal phenomena that there is nothing substantial out there objectively so the quantum physicist found it you know very you know uh, close to quantum physics and now similarly it dissolves according to the quantum physicist the, the either through analysis it dissolves to the particles or the waves in similar manner in in buddhist philosophy when we analyze it right then we can go to the atomic and the subatomic level and then you won't find anything but it dissolves into you know emptiness but at that level you do not lose the object otherwise if you end up like that then you would you know conclude being a nihilist but uh, therefore there is uh, the system of uh, ultimate reality and conventional reality at the ultimate reality there is no existence of uh, the entity but then the convention at the conventional level the everything functions it is as it is so therefore things everything has two aspects the conventional side and then the conventional reality and the ultimate reality so therefore in order to you know to develop our perspective of perspective from the you know from the point of view of ultimate reality then nothing can be found as ultimately existing then we have the other major area of dialogue uh, uh, which is buddhist uh, in buddhist psychology in which we talk about uh, buddhist system of mind uh, mind the six faculties and the 53 mental factors the mental elements and the, the, this is the you know 53 is the canonical account which contains the you know the classes of uh, negative mental you know uh, elements and the, contains the positive mental elements and uh, contains the neutral uh, negative uh, you know neutral mental elements so there are many uh, ways of uh, then each mental element is explained given their characteristics how they come into existence how they are given you know rise and then under what circumstances they come into existence and then what are the impact of these positive and negative emotions in, in our life and then how these can be tackled how these can be regulated and these have become now a major area of research in the west so we since we have a very detailed account of uh, mind training when we come to know that uh, these are the positive emotions these are the negative emotions then how we can regulate this how we can you know reduce the negative emotions how we can promote and cultivate the uh, you know the positive emotions so these uh, are in great detail dealt in the buddhist psychology and mind training and uh, for example you know anger when anger comes then it is according to buddhist kind of understanding it is uh, completely fabricated by our per perception first of all aaron burke has said that uh, uh, when the person is angry and he looks at the person then 90 percent of his uh, observation or perception of that person is uh, fabricated it is exa exaggerated so exactly nagarjuna and the you know buddhist uh, treatises have been saying that, uh, that when we have a negative kind of you know uh, emotions the object of the negative emotions are exaggerated to such an extent that they it gives rise to those uh, negative emotions and similarly attachment and uh, you know envy and all kinds of negative emotions uh, have the similar kind of root and similar kind of you know process of uh, you know and development so therefore uh, the in science the repetitive you know the um, there should be a room for you know the possibility of uh, repetition 
and then it should have a you know, third person kind of perspective. These two are very Im important. But for cognitive and not for cognitive, for you know, mental kind of research, when we do research on our mind, we cannot do it uh, with the third person experiment. We have to do it with the first person experiment. And this has been, as I was saying in the beginning, in India, that uh, these can be repeated by another person. The formulas and the systems to authenticate or to validate, this can be repeated. But it cannot be observed by third person. It has to be observed by the first person and based on the first person experience, then it has to be. Now these days, then the question might arise that these days the neurons are studied by somebody who is, uh, you know, reading the neurons expression and things like that. But uh, I personally feel that we are reading the neurons behavior, but we are not reading the mind itself. Neurons and the minds now again, this is a major, when we have a dialogue with the Western, you know, neuroscientist and uh, cognitive scientist, we always have this, uh, the, the, the problem of, uh, you know, point of reference. When we say mind, we refer not to the brain, but to, you know, a non-material kind of entity. When the neuro neurologists say that mind, then it is the, you know, material brain itself. So we have this problem always, but, uh, but, but uh, this, uh, I think, uh, now we are coming to a certain kind of, you know, under understanding between the Buddhist, Buddhist uh, you know, philosophers and uh, neuroscientists. So, first person experience, experience experiment and uh, repetitiveness, these both things are, uh, can be done in the, you know, the research of a mental kind of, you know, the uh, phenomena. And then, in the course of the discussions, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama suggested suggested that uh, the uh, the neuroscientist may do some research on these uh, emotions, you know. And then they did it, and the research was uh, amazing. That you know, that uh, they found they brought uh, meditators from Himalayan caves who have done meditation for sixty thousand hours, seventy thousand hours. And then they started to studying the, their brain of compassion, how they react with the anger, how they, you know, deal with the negative emotions, and then how they develop compassions, and what are the impact to the physiological system uh, with this kind of development, uh, the meditations and things like that. So it was amazing. Now there are so many papers published in very, you know, um, prestigious uh, journals. And many, and these, you know, the, the meditators are, you know, um, they are put lots of, you know, what you call that, uh, electrodes, and then uh, you know, put in MRI, and then their brain, you know, neurons are studied. So in the beginning, the neuroplasticity was found, which was earlier believed as not, to, you know, not being changeable, but static. But then it was found that. To, neurons are plastic in nature, right? And then, I won't go into details, but then they change the, you know, the uh, neuro, neurological circuits. Again, it was believed that the circuits which were already formed after birth cannot be changed. But then, later, through constant study, it was found that the circuits can be changed through your behavior. And then the rejuvenation of the neurons. It was again believed that the neurons once that cannot be you know, rejuvenated, but then through the meditational process, the dead neurons can be reju rejuvenated, and then now there is a new kind of you know epigenetics that uh, the external environment and your meditational practice can change the expressions of the genes. And this is a finding of the last two years that uh, the expressions of the genes can also be changed uh, through meditation. And this can, we do not need to, you know, wait for years of meditation and things like that. But uh, even a day's training before going to meditation session, they, you know, test the saliva 
And then at the end of the meditation, they test the saliva, and there's a big change. So this is very encouraging for every one of us that you know, there can be a big change you know, in terms of bringing uh, more tranquility, peace and happiness in our, li in our life. So now, uh, these uh, findings have, uh, you know, um, made lots of very strong impact on uh, scientific world and educational system and social dom domain that uh, now you can see like, uh, you know, social emotional learning, SEL has become a very prominent kind of area. And then emotional intelligence has become a very prominent area of for not only for scientists but for humanities and psychologists, right? So emotional intelligence has now these days become, you know, a kind of uh, more important than you know intellectual kind of uh, the IQ. So EQ has now in certain uh, you know uh, organizations. Not only EQ is given importance, but also the 75% for EQ and 25% for IQ. So now you can understand that if, if the person can manage his, uh, you know, mental stability and problems, then he can certainly manage the company and the governance and the system more kind of, you know, efficiently. So therefore, they are choosing the people who has a capability of managing himself or herself. So these are now becoming a trend in the West and many schools in many, not just hundreds, thousands of, in thousands of schools, emotional intelligence and social emotional learnings are taught because when you are alone, it doesn't matter it may, you know, make yourself unhappy, but when you are with the another person, at least with the another person, then your emotional control makes a lots of difference to the other person. If you are more trained and more efficient in managing your emotion, then you can make the other person also more happier, and you can, you know, make your colleagues happier. If you are more powerful, you can make more people more happier. So like that, these kind of social emotional learning, emotional regulation training, and these have become a very major trend of scientific development and educational trainings in the West. Now, what I would like to suggest is that uh, originally these were from India. These systems and elements are originally from India. Now we need to learn more about this. We need to introduce and learn more about, do more research about this. So therefore, I think it is uh, important uh, for us to pay attention to what, uh, you know, uh, to, to not, not only to pay attention to the external material science, which is certainly, you know, no doubt very important, but at the same time, we should also pay attention to the research uh, of our inner world. So this is my uh, request and with these words uh, I you know stop here and uh, uh, we can take some questions if you like. Thank you very much.